Each bio wildlife is a much broader subject than just the yeah, natural ahead, animals and stuff. So there it is. Talk about broader. <laughs> Five or six. <laughs> After hours. <laughs> Well, we knew this was a rattle because we heard the rattle. We're good. <laughs> We're good. All right. Well, You're still, I will, You're still I will get started. All right. So, you know, you're not going to hear anything really new from me today. You're kind of going to hear me kind of talk about the same things I've kind of been working on for the last year or two in particular. Um, today, I'm going to Is that Dr. Parker? You might need to mute. He's watching it on his phone, and I think it's going to be right. <laughs> Got it. Um, but, you know, the, the goal of my department continues to be to maintain a functioning natural ecosystem on Kiowa forever, <coughs> right? You know, that's, that's what drew most people here, um, and it's critical that, that we protect it. And so um, I just want to touch briefly on our overall strategy, and I'm, I know you've heard me talk about this before, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell on it, but you know, in general, our strategy to, to maintain a intact ecosystem is to focus on the species that are really, really important to that ecosystem. And so those fall into two categories, keystone and indicator species. Um, we've talked about all this before again, so I won't, I won't go into too much detail, but keystone species typically sit at the top of the food chain. They can impact the environment directly um, by their behavior or the things they eat. Um, and so the examples would be bobcats, alligators, and white-tailed deer. Um, we're going to talk in depth about two of those. Um, the other group of species are what we call indicator species. Um, so they don't, they don't necessarily change the environment in which they live, um, but their presence or abundance tells us if that you know, little part of the ecosystem is functioning the way it should. Um, so one example you know, migratory songbirds, right? These are birds that either breed here or winter here. Um, and as long as they continue to come in similar numbers to prior years, then our habitat, at least the habitat they prefer, is doing pretty good. Um, so that's one reason why Aaron has this, you know, long-term, multi-multi-year project looking at, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the population numbers and arrival times of, of this group of species. Um, but then there's some others that we focus on as well. Jim, um, is that is that the literature designation keystone species and and what was it? An indicator, indicator species. Indicator species. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, very very commonly used in, in in biology to kind of assess habitats and, and ecosystems. Um, so so the five objectives we're going to talk about today. Um, again, you've heard some of these before, um, but we're going to go through each of these in a little bit of detail. Um, obviously, you know, our top objective or, or one of our top objectives is to return our bobcat numbers to historic levels. Um, you know, number two, which kind of goes hand in hand with the, <coughs> with the bobcat numbers, um, is maintaining our deer population at historic acceptable densities, um, which is around 60 to 80 deer per square mile. Um, third objective is to continue to try to increase the use of native plants in landscaping. Um, ideally, we'd get to 80% native in every single planting, yard, roadway buffer throughout the island, um, as well as you know, new properties that may come into the community. Um, continue to focus on getting rid of invasive non-native plants. So we'll talk a little bit about what those species are. Um, and then a lot of this ties in with some of John's work on you know, the marsh management plan and resiliency, but you know, continue to work on strategies Oh. We keep having a power surge right now for some reason. Thanks. All right. Well, y'all can still see my slides? Okay. Yeah. So it's just up there. Does that affect the live stream? Should I wait till it comes back up? If you okay. can, yeah, if you can wait for a second, just for people <coughs> that's watching. Will you get into each one of these? Because we have um, two presentations um, from staff.
Good to keep going? Okay. Um, and like I was saying, the, the last one is just to protect native habitat from sea level rise and other climate impacts. Um, and like I was saying, a lot of that kind of dovetail, dovetails with a lot of what, what John's working on. Um, so first we're going to talk about, you know, again, something you've heard me talk about a lot over the last two years. Um, but just kind of give you an update on, on, on what's going on and, and what we're going to be trying to focus on in the coming year. Um, so as we all know, you know, bobcats, you know, are, they're a keystone species. They're critical to our ecosystem. Um, they control deer and rodent populations. We all know that. We know how important they are. Um, we also know that their numbers began to decline dramatically in 2017, um, primarily due to, you know, poisoning from, in particular, second generation anticoagulants. Um, you know, since that time, obviously, we've done, we've done a lot of things to try to recover that population. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. Um, but just in terms of where we are now with the population, you know, we'll know a little bit more once we start our trapping uh, next month. Um, but based on our trapping last winter and the survival that we saw um, and the productivity from our females, um, we're confident the population is increasing. Um, you know, our, our mortality rate on adult cats decreased by about four times. So I think our mortality two years ago was 75% and this year we just, we lost one out of six. Um, so that's 16, 17%, mm -hmm. so, so a lot better. Um, and then we had several successful, you know, females that had dens with kittens that, mm -hmm. that appeared to have survived. Um, and again, we'll get a better indication on, you know, the survival of those kittens as we start trapping and hopefully catch some of them. But, you know, to me, that's amazing that you've been able to see this kind of result as fast as you've been able to see it. That really is, yeah, and that, that means you can make a huge difference. Yeah. yeah. And it also, you know, gives you some you know, confidence that what you thought was the reason right. was in fact the reason, right? Yeah. Because yeah. pretty much that all we did it. in the last two years was reduce the use of these rodenticides. Right. That's right. And we immediately... Yeah, not much. You know, a great horned owl maybe, um, but, you know, a coyote potentially. Um, but they're usually, you know, they're with a female. I mean, she does leave them a good bit, but we've seen, over the years, we've seen very high survival with our kittens. So we catch a lot of them as juveniles and then you know, even further down the road. Um, so, so on the topic of, of SGAs, just want to give you a quick update on, you know, animals that we've tested since this all began um, in late 2019. Um, we've tested 64 animals to date. 73% of those have been exposed to, uh, to anticoagulants. Um, you can see the breakdown by species. Um, all bobcats we've tested um, have shown exposure. Now that exposure, the, the level of exposure, the concentrations has gone down in the last year. Um, and that's true with all of these animals, but you know, it still is, is highly prevalent in the ecosystem. Um, so we've got 13 additional samples that we just sent off um, earlier this week. So I should have those back in about two weeks. Uh, we've got some new, some new species that we haven't tested before in that group. Um, we had a number of American crows die about a month, month and a half ago. Um, we presumed that they died from West Nile virus, which is a, a fairly common thing in crows and blue jays and other COVIDs. Um, COVID, that's, that's the family name, but mm -hmm. also obviously the disease we're dealing with right now. Um, so, so anyway, so... Um, we got the results back from DHEC though, and they, they were not positive for West Nile. So now we're- Oh, they we're, were not. They were not, which we were, I mean, the symptoms seemed to indicate right. in the time of year and the species, but that was not the case. So um, we will see when we send those off. Um, so obviously we continue to do that. You know, everything we can get our hands on, we're still testing, um, looking at trends over time. Uh -huh. You know, that, that slide's interesting in, in other ways too, Jim, that seven different species were impacted by the anticoagulant. Yep. And that, I mean, that's everything we've tested. So, and that's what you've so tested, there's, yeah. There's nothing that we've tested other than DNR tested a few gray squirrels um, about a year and a half ago, and they were negative. All of, all, I think they tested four, and they were negative. Of the 13 additional samples, were they one of those seven species? 
Uh, we've got raccoons, possums, we've got two red-tailed hawks, we've got three crows, and we've got a black vulture. Um, so we'll have at least three new species to, to get tested. That's interesting. Uh, Jim, the ones, so I'm looking at the seven that's been tested, and of course, I believe out of those, obviously the alligator may be the largest. Is there, even though they had 100% exposure, are they impacted the same, even though they have the 100% exposure? as yeah. opposed to others? Right, so I mean, so yeah, I mean exposure is only saying that they had a detectable level of one of those compounds. Okay. Um, certainly the bobcats that died had significantly higher concentrations, you know, th than the alligators, for example. So okay. it probably wasn't negatively impacting the alligators. Um, in, a, in a number of the raccoons and possums, at least early on, the levels were really high it's likely that directly, you know, directly contributed to their, to their death or sickness. Um, you know, so, so most of the animals we pick up, with the exception of alligators, are already showing some signs of, of illness. How did the alligators die? Alligators were simply removed under the nuisance, our nuisance permits. Oh. So they were aggressive approaching people and, and were removed under our state tags. But while we did had them in hand, we just took them. Was there any connection between the um, poisons and the alligators' behavior? No, I mean, the, at, at high levels, there could be, mm -hmm. um, certainly. I mean, at high levels, you know, these compounds can have a lot of negative impacts to anything that it builds up in. Um, okay. But the levels in alligators were not that high. Jim? Yes. Sorry. We can just start with where you are, but I mean, I, I've seen no data. Can I share it from within here? Or do I? Share screen. That one. Perfect. Oh, now we can see it. Yes. Oh, okay, so we're good now. Yes, we are. All right. Um, so, so on you know on the bobcat uh, topic, you know what are our our focuses, our initiatives for this year in particular? Um, you know, and just it's it's two main ones. It's you know the first is we're, we're all aware of this this Clemson University study that's kicking off um, next month. It's a four year study that's going to hopefully <coughs> answer a lot of questions we still have about SGAs and bobcats and other wildlife. Um, so it's really important that we continue our commitment to that study. Um, as you're aware, town council committed 50,000 this fiscal year, um, but, but we will need additional funding for the next three fiscal years. So obviously that's something that's gonna come up again in the budget process this spring. Um, and obviously I just wanted to you know, stress the importance of that study um, and I hope that we can maintain our, our funding commitment level at least as high as we did this fiscal year. Any um, new fund, any new supporters? I do not know what the Conservancy has committed yet. Um, I know that their board heard a presentation about three weeks ago and they were generally very supportive of it, but I haven't heard a number. Um, so that's the only additional source of funding that I'm aware of. Um, and then the second big initiative is, is just to continue, you know, what we've been doing with the Bobcat Guardian program. Obviously, you know, that was a very successful program. I mean, it's what drove mm -hmm. all of the success we've had, um, but we got to keep it going. Um, and we can't let it, you know, get stale and stagnant and people kind of forget about it and then go back to what they were doing before. Um, so we continue to have us companies sign on and not use them, or is that kind of slowed up? Yeah, so we haven't gotten a new sign up in many, many months. Um, you know, I think we got, well, we got most of the big ones and most of the ones that do the work out here, you know, early on. Um, but one thing we're worried about is, okay, they committed a year and a half ago now, and at some point with turnover in the organization, you know, do they forget? Do they 
you know, have some technicians that go back to using different things. And so one thing we've done um, is added a, a section, a list of questions within the business license portal. So when, it, when these companies renew their business okay. license, um, they'll be prompted to answer a series of questions, um, including, are you a current Bobcat Guardian? Are you using these, these compounds? That sort of thing. Um, so something that at least once a year will put it into their head that, you know, they need to be remembering um, to, to do what they promised. Um, the, the other thing um, is we've, you know, we've been meeting with, with Clemson DPR um, for, for obviously, you know, since this all began. And one thing that they've, they've promised many times, and they're finally going to deliver some part of that, is some, some direct public outreach and education, um, you know, not just within our community, but in the broader statewide community. Um, and so they're, we're, we're currently working on timing, but the first will be basically a, a presentation kind of training workshop um, with regime sometimes the, sometime this spring. Um, and then there should be an additional much larger kind of symposium workshop for the public at large, um, probably in May or June, I think. Um, and that likely will be open to, you know, not just QR residents, but Seabrook and Johns Island and others. Um, and so these are things that DPR and their staff are providing. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of a grant that they, that they receive. So, you know, all of that should be, should be helpful. Jim, um, just to get back up to the funding, yeah. um, Clemson, who, th there was a couple of sources, they're still committed. Yeah, so Clemson University itself has committed somewhere around 280 Something for the enough. for the student. Um, Clemson DPR has committed around 200 okay. um, from their funds, and then you know, obviously what the town has committed, the conservancy hopefully. You know, but regulators, it, not regulators, applicators. They at this point we haven't gotten anything directly from the industry itself. Okay. All right, so we'll move move on from Bobcats to to another favorite, um, <laughs> white tail deer. Um, He's the one that hit my car. Love hate relationship with, with deer out here for sure. Um, you know, again, they're a keystone species. They can impact the environment by the things that they eat. Um, we all know they're they're a public safety concern as well. Um, they can they can be hit by vehicles, um, not only causing damage to the vehicles but potentially injury to to residents as well. Um, and I guess, you know, everyone knows that, you know, coinciding with our decline in bobcat numbers, um, our deer population began to rise substantially in 2018. Um, if you look at the graph below, this shows our density estimates um, from our late summer fall surveys um, through this fall. Um, and our target population is around 80 deer per square mile, which is represented by the red line there. Um, so you can see in 2018 we jumped above that red line, um, not substantially, but we did. Um, and then clearly you can see the last three years it's continued to, to go up pretty rapidly. Um, so obviously that's your population in four years. Did you, doubled in four years. Yep, just like yep. Brian's staff. <laughs> 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 Brian's not even here to hear that. Um, uh, Jim, yeah. when did you do the deer calling? So February of 2021. Okay. So the numbers that you showed were before or after that? So between the 123 uh -huh. was done before the, before the 100 were removed and 141 after. Wow. So that would suggest that removing 100 right. <laughs> did not do anything to, to bring numbers down and certainly allowed them to continue to rise. That's unbelievable. Point so um, we have a lot of deer and it's going to take a good bit of work to get them back to where we want them. So take a moment and tell us, how do you come up with that algorithm? I mean, there's such a specificity, 88, 141, 123. How did you do that? Yeah, so, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a guesstimate. It is an estimate, if you will, of the number of deer per square mile. Right. And so, you know, since I started in 96, we've done the same spotlight survey route. So we drive the same, same road, same speed every time we do this survey. Um, so we know how long the survey is. Um, we know based on visibility estimates, 
how far we can see, you know, into the woods, how far we can see a deer. And so basically the formula basically calculates the acreage that we're, that we're seeing. So it takes the average width. So the average distance we can see a deer and then the length of the route. And so you figure out how many acres you surveyed and then you average the number of deer you saw throughout the two or three nights of the survey. Um, and, it's, and then it just comes up with, with a density estimate of number of deer per square mile or number of deer per 640 acres. Is that a research-based algorithm? It is. It's something that's been used a, across the country, across the world for many years. You know, it's, it's not an exact estimate, no, you know, an exact count, um, but it's really good at trend data. So if okay. you just do one of them, it really doesn't tell you a whole lot, but if you've got them over time, you can be pretty much 100% confident, you know, not that we now have 141 deer per square mile, but that our population has gone up substantially, substantially. in the last mm -hmm. years. Yeah, so I mean, obviously the, the survey is plenty sensitive enough to pick up on big changes like that. And so, you know, we're, we're very confident the numbers are up and obviously we're, you know, getting more complaints, concerns, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and more hit by vehicles. And what's your denominator? How many square miles does, do we represent? Yeah, so, so Kiowa's around eight square miles. Um, so if you were to multiply that out, we're, we're well over a thousand deer. Mm. Okay. But it's not, you know, it's, we try not to do that, um, you know, but <coughs> because obviously if you multiply it out, right, you've also got houses that are taking up space within right. that and ponds and that sort of thing. But um, we try to focus on the trends and the densities and use that to set our harvest goal as opposed to a, you know, a, an actual number of deer on the island. But ballpark, they're probably around 1,000 deer on Kiowa. So it gets back to the... 100 in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, but that gets back to the calling question. So yeah. You can see... Okay. Which I, I'll talk about here. So, you know, obviously... You know, we, we recognize it's an issue. Um, we've seen this, you know, this trend starting and, and obviously it's continuing. Um, you know, obviously we want to continue to count deer every year, um, just like we've done for, for 20, 25 years. Um, and then I guess, you know, town council back in April of 2020 um, approved a deer management plan. Um, and that plan was, was to basically maintain deer numbers at a specific density or try to um, using sharpshooting. And so that's the program that we initiated um, for the first time in February of 2021. Um, you know, that work is done under a state permit um, and tags issued by the state. Um, the work can be conducted between September 15th and March 1st. Um, and then under those permits, all the meat has to be donated to a charitable organization. Um, so again, we did that for the first time in February of 2021, took 100 deer, um, and so now, obviously, knowing that numbers are continuing to go up, we're going to adjust our harvest goal upwards. Um, so at this point, we have 200 tags. Um, so the plan is, is to remove 200 between now and March 1st. Um, and then we've actually got another survey um, at the end of the month. So prior to the, prior to the harvest, we'll do another survey just because we typically yeah. average our fall and winter survey. And how much uh, meat was donated? It was some astronomical number. Yeah, I think it was 3,400 pounds last yeah, year. Yeah, that's good. Um, so we should be in the six to 7,000 pounds range this year. Wow. Assuming we get the full, the full 200. Um, and so we'll see what that does. And it may be that that number goes up again next year. Um, so Jim, um, Last year we got 100 tags. This year we, get, we were, um, the state gave us 200 tags. How do you determine how many tags to apply for? And is there a max <clears throat> a municipality can apply for in terms of the number of tags? No, there's, there's no max. I mean, honestly, um, you know, 100 was, was a good starting point to see what it would do. Um, obviously, it didn't do enough. Um, so we're just going to double it. But we could have gone, you know, it's also... Like we could have gotten three or four hundred tags from the state, probably, um, but logistically we couldn't have accomplished it. So if we have to go much, if we have to go higher than two hundred, we may have to think about a different strategy um, 
other than having Aaron and I do it because might need additional help. Yeah, you know, is I that mean, February date? Is that tied to their breeding cycle? Um, in terms of when the removal is typically done? Yeah, I mean, they're calling, we're calling in February, and isn't I, for some reason I'm thinking that the white-tailed white -tailed deer uh, breeding season in this part of the world uh, corresponds with uh, uh, February. No, so, so most, most breeding occurs between September and November here. Um, <clears throat> and so the reason that the September through March dates are given by the state is that's the time period where where there are no fawns that are young enough that might be orphaned and wouldn't survive um, mm -hmm. if a doe is harvested and so um, that's why it's done the reason we typically why calls are typically done in late winter um, number one the weather's cold so you don't have to worry about meat spoiling number two food is scarce so deer are more likely to eat corn and and go to where you want them to go Okay. So those are the two main reasons. And when you call, is there bucks and does or just any that you see? Bucks, bucks and does. But I mean, um, if, if there's not something that says it's this many bucks and this many does, it's just whichever ones you see. Yeah, so we, we try to focus on, on females um, because that's obviously where you're going to get your biggest impact on, at the population level. Um, I think last year we had around, I think, 75 out of 100 were females. Um, so that will be our target, but it may... You know, it may be a little more, a little less than that. Um, yeah, just a totally subjective. I said, I find the bucks. I have some huge ones, and you know, you go out there in the morning and it's dark, and the dog's acting up, and right. you flash your light over, and all of a sudden you say, "Holy moly!" I mean, the thing is really big. Right. Have a, and they're all they're over everywhere, but some of them seem like they've really gotten larger. Yep, there there are certainly some some big bucks out here, and, and we tend not to not to harvest those. So <coughs> they Thank continue to get a little bigger every year, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, we'll we'll move on from deer um, and go to native plants. Um, again, another topic I'm sure you've you've heard me talk about a number of times: uh, the critical importance of, of native plants. Um, to our ecosystem, um, and I'll just highlight a, a few of those. Um, you know, our our local insects and animals, right, have have adapted over hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of years to feed, lay eggs, and take advantage of native plants. Um, so that's what they prefer. That's what they prefer to eat. That's where they get their best nutrition. Um, there are a number of studies out there that suggest that, you know, native plants basically provide habitat, food shelter for, you know, up to 15 times as many different species as non-native plants. Um, there's some, a lot of non-native plants that I think I touch on this in the next slide that literally have zero value to any organism that lives anywhere in our area. Um, they're either toxic or unpalatable, and so their only value is in cover, right? An animal could hide behind it, but it can't eat it, it can't lay eggs on it successfully. So um, it's just important to realize, you know, we, we talk a lot about native plants, but it's important to realize how critical they are um, to the ecosystem. Um, you know, some of the other advantages of native plants is obviously, you know, they've adapted to, to grow here. So you don't have to fertilize them. You don't have to put pesticides on them um, because they've adapted to deal with our local pest and our local environment. Um, they really help with watershed protection um, runoff, helping aquifers recharge um, and filtering water, um, which lessens erosion and flooding. Um, and a lot of them are also because they've grown up, you know, they've, they've adapted over centuries to live in our, our salty environment. Um, they're pretty resistant to flooding during storms and other high tide events. So, you know, they don't die. They can, they can bounce back after being flooded out, whereas a lot of most non-natives um, can't do that. So as I mentioned, you know, the, on the flip side, you've got non-native plants. Uh, many of them provide absolutely no wildlife value um, other than cover. They require more, more work and effort and, and chemicals to maintain. Um, as I already touched on, they're susceptible to climate changes, saltwater intrusion. Um, and two of them I'll highlight just real quick that are very, very invasive um, that can destroy native habitats. And I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard me talk about both of these. Um, the first is Chinese tallow tree, 
Um, it's a species that's been here since the 16, 1700s. Um, basically takes over freshwater wetlands and outcompetes everything else, dries up the freshwater wetlands. Um, so it's a species the town has, has targeted. Um, I think our first year was 2010, so we're in about 10 or 12 years into, into working on, on removing Chinese tallows, and we've had great success, but it's a continual battle. Um, you know, their seeds can last in the environment for, <coughs> for up to 100 years. They can float. Um, and so they, they move around a lot and, and you get new ones every year. So it's something we, we have to deal with typically every year, but sometimes every other year. Um, and then kind of a newer one that's causing issues now is giant reed or Phragmites. Um, it's, it's the one pictured here um, at the top. Um, so it grows along the edges of freshwater wetlands um, and brackish wetlands. Um, is very invasive and basically outcompetes everything else. Um, that, that, that has value to wildlife. So, um, so kind of what, what are we going to do on that front? Um, well, just to hold on, yeah. to what extent is native or non-native planting embedded in environmental assess assessment by the ARB? I mean, do we? Yeah, so i touch on that in the next slide. Okay. Um, but, but as it stands right now, 80% of trees that go back into a, you know, a new landscaping plan that's ARB approved or an updated plan that's ARB approved, 80% of the trees have to be native. Have to be. Have to be. Is that 80, Shrub, 20? I mean, is that a rule of thumb? So if I'm a new... Just uh -huh. more than 80. It's got, it's got to be at least 80% native trees. Okay, so if I'm a new homeowner and I want to build my house, that, that's explicit. That's a hard, fast rule that you have to follow. Okay. Currently, that does not apply to shrubs and ground cover. So there is no requirement that any percentage are native. It's something that's been talked about with the ARB. Um, it's been brought up to the board um, once or twice. At this point, they haven't acted on it. Um, you know, it's something that I think is really important. It's also something the Conservancy is working on. I know they're having conversations with the ARB um, about the same thing, but I think it's it's critical, you know, that across the board, you know, ideally it'd be more than 80%, but 80% native across the board, every entity, ARB, you know, new properties we annex, what, what, you know, that we might annex, right? 80% natives is a great goal to shoot for and something we should try to do. Um, and what's the reason for not doing it? Um, some people like certain non-native plants um, and they just you know and, and a lot of times it's you know the, the argument is you know well where I came from I had these plants and they did really well and they were pretty and I had a garden and I want to do that here um, you know we often hear that native plants aren't aren't as pretty and showy as some of the non-natives out there and to some extent that is true um, but a lot of times and that's you know I kind of touch on the you know the grow native program that we kicked off you know a lot of times it's simply that either landscapers and and individuals just don't realize that there are native mm -hmm. plants that can that can that, you know that have the same color flower or look just as nice um, but then the second problem is that even if you educate them and say oh well you could use this instead it's really hard to find it mm -hmm. um, so that's you know was a big push of this grow native program initially was not only you know, setting up this database of native plants with pictures so that residents could say, okay, that's a pretty, I want a pretty white flower that'll grow, you know, in a semi-sunny area near the marsh. They can go find a native plant. Um, but then the flip side is then they got a bit of find, a, you know, somewhere to, right. somewhere to get it. And so, you know, trying Here, to work can with, you go back with to local that? nurseries and growers to make that happen, that's something the Environmental Committee has talked about a good bit. It's something else the Conservancy is working on too right now. Um, so we just continued, you know, we need to continue to, to kind of push that forward um, in the coming year. Jim, can you go back one slide real quickly? Uh -huh. In the bottom right hand corner, those ubiquitous tractor seats that are all over the island, yeah. are, those, uh, are those an invasive species or are, is every one of those that I, I see around has been actively planted? 
Yeah, they're they're not listed as invasive, so they are they are actively planted in the location you saw them. Um, okay. I put that one up there. So tractor seat plant. I'm sure you've seen it around the island. Mm -hmm. um, some people call no, it. I think giant. it accounts for about 15 percent of the non-native plants that are planted. Yeah, some <clears throat> people call it giant dollar weed. Um, but anyway, it's a plant that I never saw on Kiowa until about eight years ago. Um, okay. And then. Not, not to point any fingers, but it, it started being planted in roadside buffers and beds right. by an entity, and people <laughs> saw it, <laughs> and, now, and now it's everywhere. Now, I mean, every other yard has some of this plant. And again, it's, it's an example of a plant that has no wildlife value. That's an you know, nothing drinks nectar from the flowers. Nothing can eat it because the leaves are so thick and waxy and and it, it's basically inedible. Um, so, so I guess I threw that one up there to, to, to make that point potentially, but also to make the, you know, the counter argument, which is if you find a showy pretty native and you plant it where people can see it, well, they're just as likely to plant that one in their yard too if mm -hmm. they can go to the store and buy it, right? So it's just a matter of hopefully continuing to, again, encourage all entities to, to get on board with this 80 percent um but know. i think also with regards to that because i tried to buy that and plant it in my home and it just didn't work because i understand they, they need a lot of shade but it was because as you think about it you know these individual homeowners may have landscapers and it was recommended right yep. for me they're like you know get these you know they're great and so maybe that's the deer also, don't eat them huh the deer don't eat them You're right. right the deer don't eat nothing eats them yeah nothing, yeah, yeah we, they're, they're we have them in our yard and meat. the deer don't that's the only thing the deer don't eat that's right yeah so that so yeah. i mean you know yeah. I, it, it, it does make a lot of sense. You know, mm -hmm. if you're a landscaper, here's a plant that's pretty showy in the winter. Yeah. It provides color. Mm -hmm. Deer don't eat it. It's very easy to maintain. Right. Yeah. Sure. They do. That's yeah, right. It's become a very popular plant. plant. Um, yes. You know, and, and again, you know, in a perfect world, we, we'd be pushing for 100% native. But, but at 80%, you're still getting enough benefit to the, to the environment, but you're allowing people to plant a few yeah. non-natives and things that, that they think are pretty. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. Um, it's just trying to get to that 80% um, right. would be really helpful. Exactly. Um, and then I already mentioned, you know, these two in particular invasive Chinese tallow and phragmites. Um, those are ones that we have existing control programs to maintain. Um, it probably on, on average costs about $30,000 a year for those treatments. So obviously we just need to continue to do that. Hmm. Told you that was going to be short and sweet. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. What's, what's the status of coyotes on the island? Good question. Um, current status is we have a handful. Um, they seem to be confined to the eastern end of the island. Um, I personally haven't seen a coyote in three or four years. Um, so, you know, kind of the, the long story on coyotes, which, which is probably good to, to mention, is that, you know, they first showed up here in about 2012. Um, you know, they were in South Carolina and Johns Island for 10, 20, 30 years before that. But we saw the first one on Kiowa in 2012. Um, their numbers went through the roof between 2012 and 2014. Um, we were seeing coyotes on a regular basis. Residents were taking pictures of them in their yards. Uh, we were catching them in bobcat traps. Um, you know, we even put collars on, on. We put a collar on a coyote in 2013 and in 2014. Um, beginning in about 2016, 2017, coyotes basically disappeared from the island. Um, at the time, we didn't know why, and we still don't really know why, but it's it would be, it seems most obvious that they were impacted by the same things that bobcats were impacted by. Um, knowing that, you know, canines, you know, dogs, coyotes are somewhere around 30 to 50 times more susceptible to, to death from accumulating these compounds than felines, bobcats. So if, our, if we had a couple of bobcats die, then it's likely that mm -hmm. that's what killed all our coyotes. Um, now we don't have any hard evidence to that, but that's likely what happened. 
Um, and so we really didn't see a coyote for three, four years. And now in the last year, we've had, we've had a few reports of coyotes again, all out east. Um, so they'll probably, you know, slowly trickle back in. And, um, but I don't envision any, any issues you know, other than, you know, we'll have some sea turtle nest depredation. Um, it, it's going to happen once you have coyotes. <coughs> Hopefully it'll be, it'll be minimal. But everybody's favorite pest, the armadillo. Armadillo, yeah, that's, a, that's another <laughs> one. Um, so, yeah, so their numbers are also increasing. You know, I think we saw the first one four or five years ago, um, and now they're pretty, pretty common. You know, if you go out most any place you might you know towards the beach and the dunes you'll probably see armadillo tracks and maybe a little burrow um you know i've gotten a number of emails calls about armadillos what's what, what are we going to do are we going you know, to take any action to control them and and the answer is no um, number one it would be virtually impossible to to control them at the population level um, they're incredibly difficult to trap um, but two they they really cause cause very few issues um, other than burrows under under foundations you know in particular you know a slab foundation um, which we don't have a lot of out here though I mean, certainly we, we do have some um, you know I've had a few where you know burrows underneath a you know an outside condenser unit you know that's on a slab where they were worried and so you know it, simple solutions to the to the to individual problems is the, is the approach that that we've taken, and, and that's the one that I would recommend going for. So you don't see it as a as a hazard. No, it, it's it, it's it's quite overblown in my opinion. You know, armadillos are endemic throughout you know the entire South, and and there aren't any major problems other than you know burrowing under some sort of structure where you simply fill in the burrow um, and ideally trap the animal. Um, and then there are situations where they can, they can burrow on golf courses or other places, but I don't see that happening here because they eat, they eat insects and grubs, and I don't think there's any insects and grubs that live on our golf courses. Not on our courses. They're much too <laughs> pristine and green and, and well-maintained. Um, so, yeah, so even, we, even with armadillos here, I've heard of zero issues of them really on the golf course. Um, Jim. The Yes. These control programs for the Chinese tallow and the Phragmites uh, at $30,000 a year. Is that something that the town does or is that something another entity that has the land as lake divisions takes care of? Yeah, so it's varied over the years. When we first kicked off the, the, when we first kicked off the program, it was tallow trees only. Um, and that cost was basically split between us and the community association. Um, you know, at this point in time, for the most part, because we're only doing retreatments and the cost isn't really high, um, most of the time in the last couple of years, the town's been paying for tallow. Um, KICA has been paying for Phragmites control. Um, and now the Conservancy is actually picking up some cost to, to treat Chinese tallow in particular on their, on their properties. So when this first started, we were paying for treatment on most every, everyone's properties, or at least all the entity properties. Um, but it's kind of slowly transitioned to, well, <coughs> with a few exceptions, you know, the Conservancy and Kika kind of picking up some portion of that program. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah. Jim, a question moving away from your presentation. Um, the beach out by the ocean course, What's the status of that in terms of erosion, or do we, are we looking at some type of, you know, replenishment or adding? Yeah, um, it, it's a good question. Um, so, so we just had our our annual survey done by Coastal Science, um, mm -hmm. and so we'll get that annual report typically in late February, early March, um, and then we'll have Stephen or someone from Coastal Science come present it to Council. Um, but in a nutshell, we don't have any issues out there right now. Um, you know, there is a, a new shoal that for a number of years has been trying to attach to that east end. It's now completely attached. Mm -hmm. um, so that is going to push a lot of sand down our beach in the coming year or two, um, which, is, which is good news. Yeah. Um, and so, the, you know, the issues that we've had in the past with the, 
the tidal inlet that, that periodically gets close to the ocean course driving right. range, um, that inlet is still significantly, you know, it is a long way to the east. So we don't, we don't have any erosional issues there along the ocean course and don't foresee any um, in the near future, which is good. Well, I have oh, one of the well, don't Very run, nice. don't Thank run away. You. We have um, <laughs> Laura's presentation. Laura Lauren Ross. Lauren and the dolphins. Did did the DNR approve our request? I haven't. Help? I haven't heard anything on that. Or Lauren's. Um, Does that name? tie into your oversight, the dolphins and what happens to them? And um, certainly. I've been involved in that program when it when it first started before Lauren was even involved. Um, but but no, I mean technically, you know, anything that's in the the river or the estuary is is property of the state and their mm. job to manage. But but obviously, you know, when it comes to volunteers and that program and then being on our beach, then, then certainly have some involvement there. So really, we're we're very fortunate that we have her and people that volunteer that, that are yes. willing to come out and mm -hmm. educate the community, the public. Yeah, I mean, that that's a program yeah. that, that, yeah, it, it started very small five five years or, mm -hmm. or so ago. It was kind of a trial program um, with a, uh, working with NOAA, they had an individual who, who was doing a, a summer fellowship, internship, and, and that became kind of a little pilot study to see if you know, volunteers and educators would make a difference down there, and it's grown obviously it's into huge. A, yeah. you know a pretty big program that yeah. a lot of residents participate in, which is good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, one thing, Jim, while you're up there, if you could just put in a little plug about the South Carolina Beach Advocate Conference in oh, our backyard. Yeah. That's right. So, um, so I don't know if if y'all are familiar. There, there's a a local group called South Carolina Beach Advocates. Um, you know, it, it's, it's made up primarily of, you know, coastal cities and towns um, th that are members of this group. And so it holds an annual conference every year. Um, and this year it's on Kiowa. So it's January 31st through February 2nd. Um, and so a lot of, we've got a really good agenda um, that was just finalized yesterday. Um, so we've got we've got Governor McMaster coming. We've got Nancy Mays. You know, pretty much all the local representatives um, will be there, as well as a lot of you know the higher ups at the, at the state and, and various other other entities. So it's uh, it's it's exciting to have it here. Um, and Mr. Mayor, I know you get to give kind of the keynote keynote welcome speech um, on the thirty first. I think it's just a welcoming. I don't think. Yeah. It's a, I don't, <laughs> don't 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 make to scare me away. I know it's just a welcoming. It's just a welcome. It's just a welcome. Welcome to the welcome to Q. Welcome to Q. Right. Right. But it, I think it demonstrates the governor's commitment to Resident conservation and all mm -hmm. that stuff. You know that that yeah. it is. It's it's quite an agenda of, of uh, prominent legislators. So if any of you like to attend any of the sessions, please let me know. I can go ahead and register you. Um, send you the agenda. And if you want to pop in a session here and there, just let me know. I believe you've, you've already I, expressed I signed up, but I can't go to all four days. Oh, you don't have days. to. Just when you yeah. see the agenda, just pop in any session it's an that you want. interesting agenda. I'll forward all that stuff to you. I'm not I'm telling. I'll forward it to you again. <laughs> and, it, and it's at West Beach. Um, Conference. And yeah. so, and, and there are a number of, of other events. One thing we're doing this year that they've never, well, I don't think they've done it, it prior conferences is we're doing a field trip. That's great. Um, so we're going to take all the attendees down to Captain Sam Spit. Really? Um, Isn't that nice? We're cool. going to take them by truck, boat, and kayak. So pray for good weather. Mm -hmm. um, the otherwise, they'll all be in the truck. <laughs> <laughs> we'll need we're a lot in the of trucks. Um, but yeah, so yeah, look, look, look for that from Stephanie. And you know, I think we've got well over a hundred signed up at this mm -hmm. point for the for the group. So yeah. Um, the agenda really looks good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of, you know, a, a lot of good talks and, you know, a lot of it directly beach related, but also some resiliency stuff. And uh, so Folly, Seabrook, Edison, all, all of them. 
Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and all the, all the way up to Myrtle Beach. All the way up to Dundee. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's very good. Good point. It's a hundred, and they're looking forward to the keynote speaker. Whoever that person would be. <laughs> is, I think it's the governor, isn't it? Yeah, I, so I think he is. The governor, be. I think, ended up getting moved to the last day. He's oh. Wednesday. But, He's doing closing. Well, Opening but, is going to be representative, I believe, Nancy Mace. I think she gives the cue. Mm-hmm. be interesting. Yeah, and usually uh, Mayor, Mayor Goodwin gives a talk, too. But, Jim, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jim. It's nice always time. fun to talk with you. This is um, interesting stuff. Interesting yeah. stuff. Important to everybody. Yeah. Okay. You, John, have you gotten your wind back? You're ready to come back up here and talk for another? <laughs> I'm being facetious. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Dan, Mary, and John? I'd like to make a comment. We, have, we already um, have volunteers for the, for the uh, noise, noise, noise committee. Work group. Oh. We've had people volunteer. Oh, good. Maybe. <laughs> no, no, wait. I think we have. Good. No, nobody that has spoken to the council. Okay. Um, there's a desperate need for blood in our hospitals and emergency rooms, and tomorrow there is a, a blood bank here. And I would urge anyone that can give to please give. If you've ever needed to get blood transfusions, you can appreciate what these donations mean. Very good. Um, if I can just make an announcement quick announcement because we've had storm surge and so um, Berkeley Electric's been texting me about it. They're aware we have two separate circuits out on Kiowa. This started at about, I guess, three o'clock today. Um, Last I received the message um, was that they have about just over 800 rooftops that are without power but they're currently back feeding now with equipment failure, so maybe some people are coming on, but just let people know that Berkeley Electric is aware. There are two separate circuits out. They're doing back feeding now, and they, they had equipment failure. So they are working on it. They're on top of it. And that was a surge? There's two. Power There's surge? two separate circuits are out, I guess. I don't know what, if it was a surge. We had a surge, I'm saying, right. because of it, but two circuits, two separate circuits um, failed. Okay. So I don't think it was a surge, they failed. <laughs> and so it just calls for us. It just ended up with a, a surge because I guess when it failed, it was feeding or something, all the other. I don't, I don't know. 800, that's quite a number. That's a it is. Number. Just over 800. Yeah, so I'm, hopefully they're starting to bring some back up. But... Huh? 800. 800. It was just over 800. So the areas that they said um, was Sorrel and Oceanwood, Eugene, between, I guess, so- Sorrel and the Ocean Woods area and Eugenia to Ship Watch, and the Night Heron and, and Mariner's Watch and Windswept. Those are the areas oh, impacted. High density counts. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Is it supposed to get cold tonight? Yeah. 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 It's not freezing. Though. Yeah. Freezing's at 12 days out. At yeah. This point, so. Yeah, so. Okay. But don't worry, you can survive in 30. <laughs> yeah. Five degrees. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Just we're, you, we're adjourned. Stephanie. Thank you, John. Thank you, Jim. Stephanie. We, Stephanie, have you stopped? Just one second. We, we,